My name is Susan Wallace, uh, and I am a lecturer at the University of Leicester here in the UK, and also a new member of the EGC. And so I'm very uh, pleased and proud to be able to uh, be chairing this session on data sharing this afternoon. Uh, as Rory so rightly said in the previous uh, session, this is a resource that is being used to be used, uh, which uh, gets into the issues uh, surrounding data sharing. Um, I've had the uh, privilege of working with all three of our panel members, uh, and so I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing their talks. So, uh, Jane, would you like to start? Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. It's great to be here. It's been a great uh, day yesterday and a great day today. Um, so I kind of want to change the focus from biobanks, but to thinking about data sharing for consortia and some of the issues that that raises. Because in many ways, biobanks are another infrastructure that needs to be linked up. And I'm just as a consortia, uh, starting uh, to be. So what um, I'm going to talk about is the data sharing governance structure um, that have been in, have, have sort of come out of a number of projects that we've been working in. And so what funders tend to say to researchers is you really need to share data, but they don't say what governance model they should use. And I, I, I kind of say that with caution, because in actual fact, funders are starting to stipulate that more. But I think what we have found is that researchers have just been asked to share data and um, have then gone through the process of establishing internal governance systems. So what I want to talk about today is something is this internal governance structure, which I'm calling pop-up governance. And I will explain why I've given it that term. And it's a term that came out of a paper that um, I've been writing with colleagues at Sanger, uh, Dawn Muddyman, uh, Carol Smee, and uh, Ken uh, Karen Kennedy, who's actually moved from Sanger, but also uh, Jess Bell in my team. So what I'm going to do today is basically uh, just survey some of the literature the on the empirical work about what researchers think about data sharing, talk about pop-up governance and the benefits of this type of structure, but also some of the challenges. So what do researchers think about data sharing and why won't they share? So. My survey of the literature um, found that a number of people were concerned about patient privacy. I don't think that we would be surprised about that. The potential to be scooped, um, wanting to keep control over a data set that's taken many years to build. I think we can understand that. But also, one of the barriers was taking too much time to provide raw data, so that if they got a request, then it would take a lot of time to actually put their data in a form that was suitable for other people to use. So this came out of a paper and some research that was done by Savage and Vickers. So when will researchers share? So what are the conditions for sharing? First of all, what came out of a number of studies is a requirement or, an, or, or a desire for formal acknowledgement and citation credit of the data producers and funding agencies. A desire to have first rights to publish, and we know from genomics that that has been well established, or to have co-authorship offered, particularly if people are using um, data sets that have been already been established. Also, an offer of collaboration, so to say, well, I'm going to analyse your data again, can we work together? but also to have the costs of data retrieval and processing covered. And that was a persistent theme across the empirical work. Another key thing which um, came out of these two papers was that data provider should be able to stipulate the future uses of the data. And I think what's interesting about all of these requirements is that they're relational. 
They're about individuals actually wanting to keep some connection with the data that they've produced, even if it's being used by others or potentially being shared across a network. So these are all issues of trust. And so I think that really the key issue, there's two key issues. Trust must be mutual as the person sharing wants to ensure that the data will not be misused and the person reusing the data needs to trust the accuracy and validity of the data required. So I think there's two things that are um, going on here and trust is crucial in this process. So what is pop-up governance and this term that we've developed to actually cover internal governance mechanisms in consortia? So this came about um, when my son was getting ready to go to a festival last year. And this was his tent that he was taking. And he was saying, well, I'm going to the festival, I'm taking this, and what I will do is pop it up when I get there. So it started me thinking about actual governance mechanisms, and I was writing this paper with my colleagues at the time. And so what you end up with is a tent that you can sleep in, but it started off as something very small, round, and easy to carry around, easy to put up. For some people, their pop-up tent looks a bit like this. <laughs> so that really depends what project that you're actually involved in. So what is pop-up governance, if we use that kind of analogy of a tent? So it is a governance structure for research consortia that are multidisciplinary, and we all know what they're like. They're multi-institutional and often international, but they have a defined objective. And pop-up governance provides a governance structure to deal with the management of project deliverables but also the potentially contentious issues, such as sharing data, uh, publication, how to deal with re-consenting uh, different uses of the data. And what it does is facilitates, and I question whether efficiency, but it facilitates transparency and accountability. So why is it pop-up? First of all, like the tent, it can be put up quickly. It exists for a specific period of time, just the time that it's needed. So it can be dismantled easily when it's no longer required. It's designed for optimum productivity. So really, at a point when a project's really trying to meet deliverables, usually has very tight deadlines and things that need to be done sequentially. It's tailored for specific project needs. So your governance structure and what you actually uh, put in it can actually change depending on the project. And what it does is provide a mechanism so that the project is accountable to external bodies such as funders, but also for the different institutions who are actually taking the legal responsibility of the research. So is this just good project management? Well, I would say, no, it's not just project management. It's actually a new form of network governance. And the reason why is because it has a common purpose so that individuals actually come together. And my experience of working with these large projects is that people actually promote the objectives of the group, and that actually becomes a priority over their own interests. Not always, but quite often. Also, it requires interdependency so that the team goals and the priorities can only be achieved by people working together and there's a potential for reputational harm. So if you don't do your bit at the right time, then it means other people can't do their piece of work. And so potentially when you have a sequencing pipeline, for instance, if you have someone who doesn't do their bit, then they actually have to face everybody else and say why they haven't. So it, it's, it's the group actually working together. It's not um, somebody actually dictating what should happen. So I think that actually makes it quite different from project management. 
Also, I think you have a number of formal committee structures that actually come into play to allow the various things that need to be done to enable the research to happen. And so that makes it quite different as well. And people will play different roles in that committee structure. But most importantly, pop-up governance can't exist without an external regulatory environment to plug into. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So, and, and I'm sorry that you probably about this, but um, it's the way it is. Um, so this is UK 10K. And so this was taken from a paper, but it actually shows, and I, I suggest you do have a look at the paper, is it actually shows the complexity of what happens in a project. So you've got to know, you've got to make sure that you've liaised with um, Research Ethics Committee to get approvals. You've got to actually make sure that um, you have uh, collected data and the, the, the data has been brought together in a way that can be used. And then you've also got to set in place systems for people to have access to that data. So what are the governance components of um, pop-up governance. This is a bit like a smorgasbord, really, because there are some groups that have some of those elements and others that kind of don't. So, for instance, some groups will have, all groups have a management board. There's no doubt about that. All groups have work packages and some may have a general assembly depending on the project. The really big ones, for instance, the um, Innovative Medicines Initiative do have a general assembly, and a lot of that's actually stipulated by the funders. Invariably, um, projects may have a uh, scientific advisory board. Usually they do. But the thing that they don't always have is an ethics and governance uh, body. So that may be more that they have experts who are a part of that. Usually, they do have a data access committee. Now, all of those bodies and have different regulatory background to them. What holds this all together is that there is a project contract so that people, uh, the institutions have already come together to agree to share data and to support their researchers. There may be, um, and the management board usually is hierarchical and the PIs then dictate or encourage or cajole people to actually do their bit of the research. The data access committee can be independent but it also may have members from the consortium, and that is very important. But what's key to this whole process is that it very much depends on trust, very much depends on individuals working together for this common aim. So this is an example um, of ICGC, and it's an, it shows their... Um, uh, set up for their data sharing. So ICGC, as many of you will know, is actually an international network. And what it does is have quite an elaborate system of um, data access and approvals. Now, not all big projects are as complicated or, or have as many processes as this. But this is a very successful model and I think that it actually is able to take on a lot of different projects. So let's think a little bit about this regulatory um, landscape that um, these internal pop-up governance systems sit within. So the, inter the external landscape consists of research ethics committees, the Human Tissue Authority for the UK, information um, commissioners' offices or data protection authorities. And it's only because they exist that this structure can actually function. 
And so the management board will be responsible to funders, and I put funders within that regulatory landscape, and I see them as regulators, really, because they do a lot of the work of regulators in making sure that research um, does go ahead in a responsible way. So all of those bodies actually help to provide the backdrop for the pop-up governance. So what are the benefits of this type of structure? Well, firstly, I think it provides a cocoon for research. And in doing so, what it does is make sure that data generation and sharing is clear at the beginning of the project. And when you think back to the empirical work that I cited, I think that it's really clear for people to know what the responsibilities are, what their own responsibilities are, and how um, that relates to other people. Also, the regulatory approvals and consents have usually been obtained by the project as a whole. So that relieves the burden from individual researchers. And what the pop-up governance does is set up processes and committees to resolve potentially contentious issues. So the publication issues about who, how people are accredited and um, sorting out also data access. So it is a system that actually fosters trust between the parties. But what are some of the challenges of this system? I think the first one is what happens when the project finishes. It's a really big issue. You no longer have the pop-up governance structure in place because it's been dismantled, because the funding's finished. The people responsible, so the lead PI, for instance, might leave their institution or retire. And that's the way of the world. It's also not always clear where the data should be deposited at the end of the project. Or is it in a form that can be useful for others? And that opens up a whole discussion about data standardization and quality, which I'm hoping Paul can address. So is this system inefficient? Do, if we have a series of data access committees, are we actually going to get to a point where we get to gridlock? Now, in a recent paper, this was the um, statistics on people who were surveyed who were actually talking about whether they could access data or not. As you can see, they rarely accessed data manage, I mean, um, data that was actually behind uh, a closed doors. So this was um, people who were surveyed in genomics, and what they tended to do was look at publicly available data. So, we have the EGA, we have dbGaP, and so we have in genomics a track record of depositing data. Now, the issues are that this data is probably data which can be put together in a way that um, more complex data can't be, and, and it can be put together in a way that can be available to others. So there are arguments that in actual fact, with managed access, what we are doing is putting the majority of the funding into managed access projects, but in actual fact, more people are accessing open uh, access data. And this is just talking about sequence data. So I think that needs to be on the table. I think the other issue is in this model, where are the participants? And while the projects that I'm working with really sort of have some kind of lay representation. I personally don't think I've really come to grips with how we engage participants in the projects we're involved in and what the benefits are. And so I think what this does is actually, and my experience of being involved in consortia, is that in actual fact the participants are made invisible. And so I think this is a challenge and an issue. So in conclusion, I think that pop-up governance works well. It addresses many of the concerns about data sharing that have been found in the literature. And that's because it's building relationships and provides a framework for relationships. There are real issues about sustainability, what happens when a project finishes. 
And also, how do we, if the data protection regulations are passed, what structures do we set up to inform participants about how their data is being used? So I know that there we have a lot of systems that are starting to get traction, such as um, GRIF, which actually is a, an identifier for biobanks, the ORCID ID, which enables researchers uh, to record their publications, but also potentially use that as a passport for um, data sharing. We also have things like um, dynamic consent and the Estonian portal. So these things are starting to come into play. But I still think we have an issue about the, the structures that we build to, be, to um, actually share data between consortia. And so I'm wondering if we should start to look at mutual recognition. And I'm hoping that uh, um, Bartha will be able to sort of enlighten us with um, some of the work that's being done in Global Alliance. But I still think there is some way to go to actually making very good use of the data that's being generated by consortia. Thank you.